In my limited experience with existential panic and horror vacui, the terror at the void, um, limited but um, real enough, I'll put it that way, or it felt real enough. Um, when you're in that state, you're subjected to two conflicting and um, seemingly irreconcilable uh, mental or emotional states. Um, in a regular panic attack, you feel like your body is about to evaporate, as though you're about to, you know, <laughs> poof, non-existence, but a negative non-existence. In a state of existential panic, you think, in a sense, that, or I suppose horror vacui, you think that the whole universe is going to go that way, and it's a horrible void. It's not just a, a void, it's terrible black hole of malignant nothingness. That's the, the horror vacui that I refer to, where you're staring at this horrific, inexorable, inevitable thing called the void. Um, and of course you have, as I said, simultaneous with that feeling of too much non-existence, you have a strange feeling of too much existence, like uh, in Sartre's nausea. Um, if horror vacua is a feeling, is a fear of non-existence, then I guess existential panic is a fear of too much existence. As I said uh, in that novella that I read by Stephen King called Sometimes They Come Back, he refers to an expression on someone's face, um, a puppet that has just come to life, only to realize with horror that it's still on strings and will always remain on strings. That's you know that's kind of the, the story told in nausea. Um, my experience with the fear or the emotional state of too much existence is almost similar to feeling of you yourself are encased in a limitless layer of concrete. It's just me, and the phenomenal universe is nothing but miles, millions of miles, eons of concrete. I'm just this tiny little speck stuck in this vastness of existence, of concrete existence. So it's a strange feeling. You've got horror at existence and horror at non-existence at the same time. Now, how, did, how does one get through that? Well, I have no advice to, to offer anyone in, in a case like that. But I believe that I've uh, experienced those states and that I've come through them. And I believe that I, in little hints I get the, the impression that other people have you know, been in this state before. And I get the impression from some people, unfortunately, that they seem like they're still in that state. Um, the twin horrors of existence and non-existence. Now, how do you reconcile these things? How do you, or how do you get out of that kind of cul-de-sac, that terrible trap that you're in, the blind alley of existence and non-existence simultaneously that's creating some sort of, uh, I don't know, fission explosion or something like that, or fusion, I don't know. Not that much on uh, physics, but um, my experience has been that you've got to reconcile the two. You've got to balance off the fear of existence with the fear of non-existence. Now, how do you do that? Well, I mentioned in the previous video that um, yes, the void is there, or it may be there, or that which we perceive to be the void may be there. But that doesn't mean that it's all that's there. So my idea of fear of existence plus fear of non-existence simultaneous may actually hold in itself the answer. Because you have the fear of the void, but then the non-void is still there whether we like it or not. We can stare into the face of the void constantly until our hair turns gray with abject horror but that doesn't alter the fact that the non-void is there as well, because I don't think that the void would possibly have any 
any fear for us, or we wouldn't have any fear of it, if there was no possibility of anything but the void. It's just we fear falling into the void because presumably we're not in the void right now. Ah, hmm. so there is something other than the void, because you fear something that hasn't happened yet. You ever notice that when reading horror? You just it's only scary until it happens, and then it's like, oh, is that it? <laughs> you know. So the fear is the fear of something that is that hasn't happened yet. And if you're afraid of the void, it's because you're not in the void right now. You may be on the lip of the void, about to spill into it or whatever, but you're not there yet. Um, so again, this fear of the void and the fear of existence has in itself the uh, uh, the seed of its own solution or its own reconciliation or resolution or whatever. The same thing goes in reverse with the fear of existence. Well, why don't you counterbalance the fear of existence with the fear of non-existence? Or at least say that you can't fear two mutually exclusive things at the same time, or at least you can't rationally do it. Now, the fact that this is possible, however, the fact that it's possible to simultaneously fear existence and non-existence uh, leads us to, if you ask me, to the inevitable conclusion that um, it's logical to say that we are not rational beings. Um, I fear two things which cannot possibly, according to my own reason, happen at the same time. Existence and non-existence cannot take place at the same time, and yet I'm simultaneously terrified of both. Um, therefore, I am not rational. Now, should I be rational? Some people say, yes, you should be rational. And if you're not rational, that's a defect. I'd say, yes, maybe we should be rational, but sh should we be nothing but rational, because if we are nothing but rational, we are we leave ourselves woefully unequ unequipped for terrible things like horror vacui and existential panic. Um, because these things are irrational, but they are all consuming, and they happen to extremely logical, intelligent people. <laughs> um, oftentimes, you get the impression that existential panic and fear of the void take place more often in intelligent, rational, and logical people than in others. And I guess the an obvious conclusion to explore in that regard is maybe you've gotten too logical and your 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 logical tools cannot cope with the irrational fears that you have as an irrational human being or a, a human being that has powerful elements of irration, <laughs> unreason built into it as part of its fundamental makeup. So the amendum response to this is generally along the lines of what he's saying we abandon logic and reason and just go crazy. No. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate the fact that you know we've always got in Mendem there to leap on any suggestions that we take an absolute point of view. What I'm saying is you've got to accept the fact that part of you is irrational and part of you is rational and you have to reconcile the two. You have to reconcile the fact that you're capable of paradoxical thinking and paradoxical feeling and paradoxical being. I have the capacity as a human being to fear both the void and existence. Um, and if I just say that that's a stupid thing to fear and I'm just not going to deal with it, well, watch what happens. You just compound the problem. But if you say that I'm going to throw reason and logic down the sink because it actually is, I don't know, bad or whatever? No, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but watch what happens when you completely throw reason and logic down the tubes. It, you don't want that either. How do you reconcile logical and non-logical? intuitive and rational or linear. Um, <clears throat> I would say that that holds the key to existential panic and, uh, and horror vacui. It holds the key to working these two things out. Um, we tend to see things, if you're a logical kind of person, in either or terms, which is why I have a problem with logic. And it's not 
in as much as I have a problem with logic because of the fact that it doesn't work, it's simply that it's only good for dealing with certain things. Logic is one of our developments, one of our tools. It's when you decide that it that you are its servant that it kind of turns against you. Because when you have one of these terrifying moments of what seems to be emotional intellectual clarity and you fly into a state of Zapfian existential crisis, your rational side suddenly is of no use to you. <laughs> it can't help you cope with this. Or with uh, Sartre's nausea. You can't your rational side doesn't have answers for this. But if you've decided that the rational is the only side you're going to listen to, you're in serious trouble. Uh, because the irrational is howling for attention, and you're saying, no, I'm not going to pay any attention to you. Um, reconciling the rational with the irrational. Reconciling the linear with the intuitive. Whew. Uh, that's a big one, isn't it? But I think that it has potential to reconcile and resolve those issues. The void, the horror of existence, the horror of non-existence. Um, this one is probably, even though I'm known for it, or a lot of people say that I make too many cryptic vid videos, I think this one might be the most cryptic I've made in a while. But anyone who has actually been through existential panic or any kind of experience of that nature probably will know what I'm talking about and if you don't get what this video is about well <laughs> lucky you <laughs>